So let's get into questions and answers. And Victor, I'm going to need your help with this as far as uh, turning all that on. Yeah, and sure. Then I think, and then I think I'm going to look into the feed. We're, so we're at 3 o'clock. I'm willing to stay on for 30 minutes if you folks are and, and, <laughs> and keep giving questions. Awesome, Tommy. Uh, I've actually been chatting with our community here during the, while you were doing your presentation. So I have, actually have a few questions already pulled up here from some of our folks. Um, how about I read them out to you and then you go yeah. ahead and, and answer them and we'll just hit one after another. And if you're still on, go ahead and submit your questions. We'll, we'll kind of run with them with Tommy. Okay. Good. So the first question is from Daniel. Uh, he has two questions. The first one is, Tom, are you a millionaire slash retired yet? <laughs> I'm in the screen printing business. Are you kidding me? <laughs> um, <clears throat> no. I actually do know people that have become millionaires in the screen printing business. Um, the truth of the matter is um, I've done pretty well, but uh, without getting into too much detail, we got killed and clobbered by that recession that to me is we're still recovering from, from, you know, in 2008, 2009. And actually that was a point when I decided to kind of downsize our screen printing when we were, yes, making a lot of money. I don't, I won't get into specifics, but making a lot of money running eight presses. A lot of that business dried up. It's come back in certain ways, but you know, I'm 52 years old now. It started when I was whatever, 18 or whatever. Um, that's why I'm doing more at Deco Pro. So I'm not saying that to discourage you, you can become a millionaire in this business. Um, I'm not trying to recover a lot of the money I've lost in the past for a lot of it because of the economy and so forth, but I'm doing pretty well, but I really enjoy being a deco pro. And that's why I said, that's kind of my, my new, my new venture. Oh, but we are certainly paying a lot of bills with the screen printing that continues to go. So I hope that answers your question. Awesome. All right. So he did have two questions. Here's the second one for you again from Daniel. Uh, Tommy, how do you price that stuff? If you paid cash, um, what do you I'm do sorry, say that, say that again? Yeah, so he's asking, what do you, how do you price that stuff if you paid cash? What do you do once you pay the machines off? I'm guessing he's asking, does your pricing change if you've already paid off the machine? I would say no. Um, let's, so let's take a, a, a very typical example, <clears throat> a five-year um, lease where – uh, a lot of these lease companies, you know, you pay off a dollar at the end and it's yours. So you got two things to consider. So you factored in your pricing, you made it competitive, and you went and made money. And now that press is paid off. That's gravy you should keep. You would never want to give that back. Furthermore, you and you invested. So you didn't make maybe, now you're going to make bigger profits. Now those machines are paid off. That should be part of your plan, actually. Because of, most of these machines, you can make, you can you can work them for a long time. That said, you also want to be prepared for maybe you need to change out a machine and so forth that you're going to have an expense again. But back to scenario one, which I like better, is paying off your machine. Um, and I'll give you, for instance, when we had those eight presses, we bought those pre We made a point of buying used, um, you know, like 14 color and 16 color challengers because they were a lot less expensive. And certainly we paid them, and we did them on a five-year note. Um, they weren't all bought at the same time, but when they were paid off. We didn't change our pricing. We just kept that. That was crazy. Um, so no, yeah, your pricing doesn't change. If anything, add a dime. <laughs> Good tip there. All right. Next question from Marco. He's trying to determine how to break down ink costs on a per piece basis. So this is one off pieces for screen print, I'm assuming. So how would you price or do you price on a per <clears throat> piece basis for screen print? Well, uh, I'm not quite sure. I fully. Are we talking about the? You said in cost specifically. In cost. That's what the question is. And Marco, if you're still here, feel free to uh, elaborate on that if you like. Uh, but the original question is trying to determine how to break down in cost on a per piece basis. Okay. So based on that, unless he elaborates more, because I don't know if he means like actually to set up and print one piece. Um, but really, uh, two ways. Kind of like I mentioned at the beginning, um, you you can look at and your and your uh, ink suppliers will give you the rating. And honestly, I haven't looked at it in a while because, but I, I believe it's it's always been one square foot of ink through I think it was a a 155 or or so forth mesh. But in general, 
uh, you should get a thousand shirts with that. So that's a pretty good starting point. Now, if you're print, if you're if you're constantly printing 16 by 18 or something like that, then you'll have to do the math and put that in consideration. But basically, you take a 50, um, and I'm gonna have to open up a calculator because I am not a human calculator. Um, but let's let's say you got fifty gallon, uh, fifty dollar gallon of ink or sixty or whatever it is, and you divide that by a thousand pieces. I know it's, 50, it's five cents. I knew it was. I was gonna say that. So you got five cents. There's your per unit cost for just the ink. Now, do you really get that coverage? Well, those are the things you can consider. So maybe it's seven hundred pieces, or maybe it's twelve hundred, and you do the math. If so, but I stopped doing that and started looking at as I showed in my example, where we had history and we knew how much ink we were buying and we just made sure that was part of our unit cost based on our figures. But certainly if you wanna build out your material cost per piece, you just gotta find out how, you gotta get the ratings from your ink supplier and what, it, they'll, they'll tell you what kind of coverage and how much ink you'll get per gallon and just do the math like I did there, real simple. Okay. That's good. And, he, and and Marco did follow up. He said, you were right. The, the way we interpreted the question, that was his original question. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Thanks for following up with this, Marco. Uh, next, we have Whitney also with two questions. Uh, Whitney asks, Hello. are you able to share this spreadsheet to show, us, uh, to show with us? Uh, so that's a spreadsheet you were using earlier. Um, and I think we spoke about that. Um, will you be sharing that? Yes. Yeah, we're, we, we are going to share it. Um, every, Victor, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, everybody will get an email, right? After everyone will get an email. I'll make sure to include a link to that spreadsheet as soon as you make it available. Yeah, we're going to put it in a different, yeah, we'll get it prepared so that we can send a link. And I, I'm just going to, we'll probably remind you of this, but just a forewarning or I'll add it to the spreadsheet itself. You know, use it, but you're going to need to manipulate it. Um, so it's a great head start. Um, if you're familiar with spreadsheets, I did not do some of the things that, oh, that I did with where you can set, you, where it's easy to copy and paste stuff around without losing the cell that it's referencing. So be careful with it. It's not like a, an app per se. So know how to use a spreadsheet. When you use it and modify it, maybe keep a copy and then make a copy and start editing it. Mm -hmm. um, so that you make sure your figures are right without getting into too much detail. If I refer to a field, and I didn't, I forget the term that's used in the spreadsheet, but use like a dollar sign. So it's always that field that refers to no matter where you're referencing them from. I don't know how perfect the spreadsheet was set up. I blasted through this thing just to put something together. And I may have taken, I know I did, maybe, maybe made some shortcuts. But the math is right. And it's doing what it's doing. And you certainly can use it and modify it for your purposes. So yes, we'll be glad to do that. Long answer, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, here's Whitney's second question. When you add an additional color for an underbase, are you also charging a setup fee? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I guess in theory, yes. Um, I that is, um, but that's because I have been for over 20 years not charging a setup fee. So we just charge the uh, an additional color, and we also don't factor in a whole bunch for for the setup. We factored in ten dollars in our case. And that was because as I explained earlier, in theory, if I know what my overhead is and my material costs are in a year and I factor that into a per priest rate, in theory, I'm covering this, all those materials anyhow, but I felt comfortable throwing 10 bucks in the cover, whatever it might be. Maybe we broke a mesh in a certain job or some of those other things. Um, so in theory, when you add, since it's adding a color, I guess you could say it's adding in that 10 bucks, but the customer doesn't see it and the pricing is competitive, so it works. Now, if you are having a separate screen charge, um, Victor, you're gonna have to remind me of this because I don't remember. I think it does. The system, if you set up mm -hmm. a screen charge, yep. it's, and it will add for the underbase. And there's no way around that. So if you don't want to, um, let's say you print 12, 24 pieces, you might charge, you know, a lot of people will charge for the extra underbase or a flat rate, but not want to charge a screen charge because they might say, hey, small order, let's just flash it, print it, double it, not even set up that second screen. A lot of people won't set up a second screen for the underbase until they're at 72 pieces, 96, mm -hmm. everybody's different. Um, that, to answer your question though, the way DECO works, if you have setup charge assigned it, and you're using underbase as an additional color, it's going to assign that screen charge for that. 
Yep. So the only way around that, yeah, and there's no way around that. Um, I hope that answers your question. So if, if, you're, if you're using a treat as an additional color and you factored in your screens, again, it's factored in, but your customer doesn't see it. Um, that said, there might be a workaround or, you, or you'd have to do a manual edit. If you're entering in orders for customers on the back end, you can always override with the system. So in other words, let's say you have a three color with an underbase, you know, uh, red, white, and blue plus white underbase, in essence, four colors, but you only want to charge three screen charges. Deco, you create a quote, Deco's going to say, okay, there's four screens at uh, $25 a piece, that's 100. You can override that and charge them just for three. But that's a manual override, and your website's not going to do that for them. I hope that answers your question. All right. Next one up, uh, Steve. Steve asks, how do you recommend charging design services, uh, either flat rate per uh, dollar per hour or any other ways? Oh, that's a good question. I've been across all over the board on that. Um, <laughs> so I've got a couple scenarios that I think work. Um, hourly is really tough because I, for whatever reason, it, it, it's, a, it's the garment industry and people do not appreciate rates when it comes to art. Now, if you go out and say 25 bucks an hour, which in my opinion is pretty cheap for, for artwork, <clears throat> um, then you might not have any issues. But if you want, you, it's really tough in our industry to charge high design fees like they do in the, media, in the general marketing industry and so forth where people get paid a higher rate. It just is what it is. Um, and I've seen that across the board. So one way to do it is to create packages. Package A is 25, package B is 75, package C is by quote or package C. And what are those packages? Okay, package A is, hey, um, use, we'll modify one of our templates. And package B might be, hey, refer to a template, tell us you want to do to it, and we'll do it. And then package C would be refer to a template and we might quote you if it's well beyond what we could do with package B. I, I mean, I, I know I'm kind of blabbing here, but you get the idea. I've worked with packages and that worked kind of good. You know, it's like that way you can say, hey, you, you, can, you can change your reference point based on what really the job is, but not get too complicated, not necessarily have to calculate hours. And you might win some and lose some. And you gotta understand too, sometimes it is just marketing. So it's okay to sometimes, hey, it took two hours to do that art. We only covered ourselves for an hour. If you know that, and a lot of times you're actually doubling your money on other projects. Again, it's, you gotta look at the whole, not always every individual job. If it makes it easier to market and quote somebody, rather than, oh, let me get back to you and see what the artist says and a day passes and blah, blah, blah. And it, let's face it, that adds up when you have to go back and forth figuring out those art charges. Well, that's one method. The other method is um, have it included up until a point. So if they, obviously, if they're, uh, if they're ordering online and they create the design, no charge. However, what if the artwork is got issues that you got to fix, but you find nine times out of 10, that is, you can fix that in 10, 15 minutes, maybe even a half, maybe, or all the way up to a half hour. Well, maybe you got to make sure you, you cover that labor in your run charges and you, and you say no charge to fix your art um, up and up, up to 30 minutes of art and you're covered. So then you just do it and you feel, and you factored into your pricing, which means on jobs you didn't have to clean up, you made a little bit extra. And you got to play with the math, but you'd be surprised. And maybe it's just fifteen dollars per job you factor in that covers most circumstances, and you're always making that money. So there's a, so many answers to that question, and I just tried to give you a whole few scenarios. I hope that helped. If you've got a more specific question, um, shoot a note over to Victor. Yep. All right. Uh, next question. I I've had to be in a have to be in and out and take care of a customer will be, will you be at Atlantic City show? Okay, so that's more of a, <laughs> okay, I think this person might not no longer be in, in the session, but to answer that okay. question, yes, we will. I don't know. <laughs> we will be at Atlantic City show, at least that um, I will and, and uh, Tony also, part of our support team here at Deco Network, we will be attending Atlantic City ISS. And I believe that's in a week and a half or so. So if anybody's in the area, feel free to come and check us out at the booth. Okay. All right, so next question from Johnny. Johnny asks, 
so to use the website, uh, Daco Network. So to use Daco Network, we set up both an affiliate and then set up a fulfillment center. Okay, so I think that question is more trying to understand the concept of within Daco Network, what a fulfillment center is versus an affiliate store, and if both need to be set up in order to get your Daco okay. Network website to work. That, that's a good question, especially if you're just looking into considering Daco Network. <clears throat> um, the fulfillment center. Um, is is basically where it starts. So when you when you start setting up your Deco Network system, your your main fulfillment center is going to have a website. Uh, you know, of course, nobody's going to know about that site until you direct traffic to it. So it's not like you got to be scared. And it's not, but it's but then you're going to have to go through all the steps of setting up your pricing, the blanks, your your decorating tables, uh, how much you're going to mark up, or who's uh, what supplier are you going to use to populate your websites and your quoting system? Um, so all the setup. When you've done that, the hub part that I mentioned where you can enter in quotes and orders, I didn't show that on here because that really wasn't just focused on that. But the fulfillment center is in place. Actually, it's, it's in place when you first sign up. It's just that you got to go put in the settings for how, you, you know, how you're going to ship things and what you're going to charge. Again, all your shirt costs and so forth. But it's there's nothing. It's not like you got to go set up anything outside of that. You got to put in the the data, the parameters of how how you want things to price. The website is going to use a starting template. It's also going to be there, but you're going to want to go in and make it look like, um, you know, how you want it to look, and it's pre-populated with products, how you set them up in the fulfillment center. So that's your website. Now that when you want to add a website for an affiliate, you're going to create, you might clone a site or create a new site from scratch. It's going to by default have those same products in it. You can tell you could set a store to have limited products, not have necessarily all the products in fulfillment center, but your fulfillment center is your core. That's where all your products are. That's where you set up all your decorating prices. And then each fulfillment center has its own store, which it can set up. A, that store is just a store. It doesn't, when people go view the store, it's not seen as a fulfillment center. It just means that the, the Deco subscriber, it's their store, and they can control it however they want. When you set up a new store as an affiliate, again, it's going to be that it's going to look up those same core products. You're just going to control how much, what their bottom, you know, how much, what, what is the pricing that's going to determine how much commission you pay them, like I was talking about earlier. And then you can how much they can change the settings and how much money they want to make. You can, you can help them and the back end under administration restrict how many products are available and so forth. So to answer, I, I guess the short answer was you start off with a website and a fulfillment center right away, but then you got to go set those things up for your specifics. And then you would add an affiliate store when you need them. Um, that, and uh, more or less that's how that works. So we, I, I hope that answered your question. Awesome. So we have uh, two questions that um, I'm going to answer. Um, so this one comes from Jasmine. She asks, where can I find those spreadsheets for data analysis? Um, so we will be sending those out in an email. Everyone who registered will be getting an email with the, uh, from us with a link to the video and a link to um, the spreadsheet that, Tommy, that Tom was using. So we'll include all of that in that email. Next question by Gus. Gus asks, can a copy of the webinar be available to review later for resources, either video or transcript? So I just want to read out those questions. And yes, we'll be sending that out to your emails uh, that you use to register to this webinar. OK. So the next question is for you, Tom. Uh, mm -hmm. Josh asks, is there a capability to integrate uh, the product, Deco Network, uh, the product workflow of Deco Network to sales coming from a Shopify store? Mm. Um, I, unless I don't, Victor, I don't believe mm -hmm. so, right? No, yeah. we do not have any direct yeah. integration with Shopify. Um, we have seen uh, people who manage Shopify stores use Deco Network, but not not they're directly. Yeah. What, what they're doing is... Yeah, they're having a, <clears throat> go ahead. Yeah, I think you were going to mention it too. What they're doing is they're they're entering their orders coming from Shopify. They're... They're plugging them into their Deco Network business, um, the the order management system, uh, to include those orders in the production flow. Because 
the businesses are. Uh, the production floor is really looking at Business Hub from Deco Network. So there can be sales happening from various different other locations, and people are actually uh, entering those back into the Deco Network Business Hub. Um, do you have any other I insights on that? On that. I, I do. Yeah. Um, and that's what I was hoping you were going to say, because I, I haven't had to deal with that a whole lot with, with Deco Pro clients. But basically, in the long haul, if you want to, you know, the, the Shopify sites don't really let you manage production, which is why you have these people taking those orders, plugging them into Deco so they can manage them, do billing and invoicing and all that. Well, if you have, I don't, you know, if you have a whole bunch of Shopify sites, you can get labor intensive. But ideally, if you wanted to get in Deco and have a much more improved experience, you would really rebuild your store on the Deco platform and rebuild those products, those decorated products that you have in Shopify. Um, and, and you would basically replace Shopify. Because once you can do everything you need to do with Shopify and more, and now when they go to buy, it automatically brings those orders into production. You don't have to manually rekey them in, and it's done. Um, so that, so if you were, if you were considering, Hey, I've got Shopify sites, I want to get into Deco, but what am I going to do with my Shopify sites? You can, you could take those orders and key them in just to get them through production, but ideally you would rebuild your site so that, and you can do that. So if you've got a domain for your Shopify site, you would first build your site preview and make sure you're happy with it. Make sure you got to set up any URL redirects. You'd have to check all the, uh, different, the site map of your, uh, Shopify site, which is probably not that much, but whatever those URLs are, you can set up in Deco to say, okay, when I change this site to be my domain and I don't want to lose any Google juice, those old links, I don't want people to find a blank page. You can, you got to do your homework, but it's very doable in Deco. Do it all the time. Make sure you set up your URL directs so that if they went to an old product page, that's not exactly the same address, it'll forward them to the new product page on your newly built website that you did through Deco. Yep. Yep, I agree. I agree with that. Okay. We so, prefer. Yeah, I do. <laughs> next one. Uh, next one comes from Matthew. He, it's a two-parter. I'm going to give you the first one, uh, the first part first. How do you do commissions for the fundraising platform for printing shirts? So this is the um, the campaign stores, the fundraisers. How do you do that? Um, boy. Um, well, you, you set up uh, a, a default um, commission rate for your fundraising stores, so, uh, which I think is 20, but you can change that. And um, it's really, it's kind of like an affiliate store, but it's separate. So when, the, when Deco, when someone creates a campaign site, it is a new URL, but it's basically a one page site. Here's the product and you can order it and those orders will come into your hub to manage them. Um, actually, it'll, it'll batch them is one thing that you can print them all at once. But it's really just the same as setting up a commission rate for an affiliate. You just, uh, so you set up what, what the commission is, and that means, again, just like I was explaining earlier in the affiliate store, you're going to give them so much discount off of your normal pricing whether you set up in that fulfillment center. And it's just one key entry whether it's 20% or 30% or what have you. Now, I don't know if you had more in-depth thinking. I'd have to, talk, you know, discuss that uh, separately. But I, is there anything you want to add to that picture? Because that's really all it is, it's just setting up with that, mm -hmm. what your fundraising campaign, uh, it's going to use the default commission. So I, I guess I could say this. You, know, you could change, if you wanted it not to be 20, you could change your default commission, say, to 30. But if that's not what you want to offer to your other affiliate, non uh, fulfillment center stores, you're going to want to set those up as a different commission, perhaps assign a group, you know, so that they're always at 20 or something, because you do have, it, I do know the fundraising works off of whatever the system's default is. So if you change that default, which would apply to new affiliate stores, you got to take that into consideration. You can create what's called a store group and call it with a, you know, so that all your stores don't get a different 30% commission or sprint, whatever that is. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, here's the second part to, to Matthew's question. How do you change the donate slash goal amount on the fundraiser page to say the amount left over or uh, remaining amount? 
So uh, I'm guessing Matthew might actually already be using Dango Network and is asking about the, the campaign stores. Um, yeah. Did, yeah. So how to change the... Uh, yeah, he just Matthew just replied back. He said yes. That's exactly okay. what he's asking. Yep. Okay. Uh, and he, did, uh, he, he laughed out loud also. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's do this. Um, where's our demo store here? There it is. <clears throat> and I don't believe we have a campaign uh, set up on this particular demo store, unfortunately. I think I do. On, I think I do on mine. All right. So bear with us. This one's going to take just a couple, maybe like a minute to get in there um, so we can have an actual uh, visuals to go along with that one. Because this one does, it, it is going to require a little bit of visual to answer your question. So as long as we're on the topic, we might as well just cover it. Okay, a couple things. Now, this is just my Deco Pro site, which I have a whole separate hub for and stuff, and it's just for managing, working with clients. Um, but I left some of the just basics intact. Um, so it's using, in this case, all the products. I'm going to just say on a side note, there's a way to get around that. So, because we have a, uh, we also have a fundraising site. Oh, okay. Um, Matthew just clarified his question a bit. So a little bit more. Focused. So Matthew followed up with, uh, it only, um, only days amounts remaining to go. So I want I wanted to say the amount left for purchase. Example, I have a social media influencer as clients and they don't want it to look like a donation site, but more of a sale of the amounts of products left. So I guess more of a product left, how much product is left? Does he have an example, one I can plug in? Hmm, Matthew, do you have an example? <laughs> I'm just repeating. You can hear both of us, yeah. Uh, he is typing, so I'm just gonna. Okay, example. He said. He said to give him a second. He's gonna type it out. Okay. While he, while he's doing that, if anyone's listening, um, <clears throat> I, I, I know in the in the future you're gonna probably see more improvements. I don't know when. I can't speak to the developers, but with the um, campaign. Um, but that said, it's working. It works very well, but albeit a one product kind of source. So, you know, we they can not multiple products at this point. But one of the things I've run into myself and no others is they don't want their whole entire product database to be available on fundraiser site. They want to change the way the pricing is because it's kind of a different animal. You know, if someone brings you a hundred t-shirts to screen print, versus, okay, screen printing 100 t-shirts that are all going to be individually folded and mailed out to different people. You might want to factor that into your decorating price, not necessarily, but it, it could change the way you want to mark things up and treat it as a different business. So that's what I did on my fundraising site. We cloned just products that we wanted to use and keep it simple. It actually needs to be updated, but we only wanted to have some hoodies and some t-shirts. And we could control that once we created items created a separate website that we called Fundraiser T and told that site it's limited to certain products for these fundraising products and gave them a different product default so that it looked up a different price table for printing rather than our normal print table. So there are ways to do that. It just where if you're trying to do it all off your main fulfillment site, it's going to all use the same pricing. So it's just something to consider, which can work. And if you want, uh, you still have a shipping to cover the time for all that individual. So in other words, if you still charge the same rate for a hundred shirts, but then they're all mailed out, which is kind of typical of a fundraising campaign. If they're paying a flat rate of $5 and that covers the time for you to do that extra work, well then that'll work for you as well. But I'm just letting you say, you let you know, there is a way you can actually treat the products and decorating prices and everything separately, but you're going to have to create product defaults and a separate store to do that properly. Um, do you have that domain yet? Uh, nope. Uh, so we're still waiting on Matthew to follow up. Okay. Um, but let's. Got another question? Maybe? Yeah. In the meantime, and Matthew, take your time. Uh, oh, he just dropped in the the full example. Okay. He says. Do you want to switch screen to show me or? Um, 
is it's not a URL. Okay, I'm just clarifying the question. Uh, so um, he says, social media influencer, his client, wants to sell 100 DTG printed or screen printed shirts. Instead of the layout of the fundraiser site saying amount left to go at the bottom, he wants to mm -hmm. change that title to say amount of 100 T's left to sale. I guess the client would want this to look like a limited amount of T-shirts are available and you can pre-order them prior to them being produced. So uh, without looking at the example, I, I, I know the window. Um, mm -hmm. And I just can't think of any campaign offhand to go peek at. But basically, um, the short answer is yes, you can do it. But it's not going to be um, – you're going to have to manually, uh, you're going to need to know some uh, CSS and or potentially JavaScript. And yeah. you cannot you cannot edit it up front because when Deco creates a campaign, it's not, uh, you can't set up at this point exactly how that template, besides the main page, there's really no editing. You can't change what headings are and so forth. So you, you, there's no place for you to set that up front so that when the store is created, it'll pick up on that code. You have to wait until it – so let's say you're creating a campaign on behalf of a client, or even if they created it, you have to wait till that store is created. Then you can go in and style um, – and, and I'm going to tell you this. It's the, the link to get in and the back end um, for editing the CSS for a site, they're hidden. Um, so you – only because it's not meant for that at this point, but there are workarounds, and I, I can't explain it all here. There are work. There, yes, there's a way to do it, but it is not in any means um, uh, intuitive, and there's no interface set up for you. Um, there's there's links that you would normally use to edit CSS on a website. They exist, but they're just basically turned off for campaigns because it, when Deco built campaigns, um, it built to, to style those sites initially um, so they kind of just hid that stuff but you can get to it and you can't edit it but you would have to do that for every site so I you know uh, beyond that I'd have to really get more in depth and mm -hmm. I'm sure you how to do that yeah uh, and on that note um, if you do know how to do that uh, Tom uh, I think it might be a perfect yeah. time to remind people that you are Deco Network a, a Deco coach to Deco Network so if they do want to okay. be in contact with you how do they do that? Uh, where did they go on our website? Oh, um, why don't we go to that website? Yeah. And then um, great point. We got that. So if you go to deconetwork.com, you'll see a link to get in contact with the Deco Pro. And, uh, and you can request me specifically. Um, and, and you just basically in the header here, you'll see that link here for the Deco Pro. And more specifically, you want me to copy and paste this address in the uh, thing or will that not work? Or do you want to include it in the email you send out, Victor? Yeah, we're going to include it in the email we send out. But um, if you guys are watching and curious, uh, you can come here. And um, at the bottom of this page, there's a form. You can fill that out. Let us know what your needs are. And then make sure to mention Tom, Tom's name. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll link you, you guys up together so you guys can have a conversation. Yeah, so just where it says I need help with, say, I want Tom to help me with or something, you know. Yeah. Or Tommy, that's kind of my nickname. <clears throat> You'll probably end up getting me anyway, but it doesn't hurt to um, – do that. Yep. So yeah, deconetwork.com forward slash deco pro is the address to get there. Yes. What else you got there? All right. Next question. Barry, um, he's asking, what's the best way to get into contract work? Oh, <laughs> uh, that's a, I, I guess I could just give best way to get into contract work. Um, it's a huge field and there's several, there's a lot of different markets. The toughest one is going to be to get into probably contract for retail, meaning, you know, calling up on Nike or the suppliers, because they, you know, yes, they got machines, but they also contract a ton out. Um, uh, you know, and that's just going to be, um, 
first of all, you better be good at it, being able to work at a low price because you get into that market, they're, they, they're going to be, I'm not saying Nike specifically, let's just say that whole umbrella of manufacturers that are going to have pay a printer to print the shirts for them. They're also going to, um, they're tough enough to the crack and they're going to be pushing you for probably the lowest prices out there. That's just the reality of it. Furthermore, they're probably going to ask for um, additional services that you've got to be ready to do efficiently. And that's tagging, labeling, you know, a whole, whole plethora of different services. Not all of them, but, you know, might be add-ons. Um, so that's a tough market to crack. I'm not saying you don't do it, but, and then it's going to be a lot of phone calling, maybe trade shows to get into those markets. The quickest avenue that I think people get into, including us, where we got we we started to get pick up in some of the retail, but quite frankly, walked away from most of it because they don't pay enough. And that was on uh, the promotional products business. That's the biggest avenue, and you see decorators starting with their local market. There are promotional product resellers that out they'll ship you the shirts. They'll buy from S and S and whatever. They'll ship you the shirts. They want to know that you count them, by the way. Make sure that you know you got to do your duty and make sure everything's accurate. But those are probably the most reliable market, the quickest jump into the market to be able to provide printing service. Um, and then you can maybe get in the organizations, you know, look at ASI, PPAI, uh, to find uh, lists of people and uh, maybe do their trade shows and so forth and get in front of these people, show them you're reliable. Um, you're gonna have to look at what the pricing is and what's out there. Um, and then there's probably a lot of other sub-markets too. So I mentioned the big retails and promotional products. There's going to be manufacturers and so forth, people that print for specialty industries like uh, the gift market and so forth. They might have designs and they have their own line of shirts, but they don't decorate. You can go after those. And you can do a lot of this probably through social, social marketing. You have people setting up Shopify sites, um, but then you're talking small numbers. Now you're going to do small fulfillment. So there's a lot of avenues. I hope that helps, but otherwise um, it's a big topic to be quite frank. Yeah. It seems like a lot of work yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everything is work. There's no free meal. <laughs> yep. All right. Next. Uh, Anthony asks, um, I have been using Deco for over six years now. It's a great program. I have tried other software and nothing can compare. Well, that's, that's more praises than a question. Thanks, Anthony. I would agree. <laughs> so here's the question uh, from Anthony. How can, we add, uh, how can we add on like flash charges, uh, special effect charges, and so on? Oh, boy. Well, flash charges is easy. Um, my screen's still showing, right? Yes, we got your screen. I probably still have that screen open. Uh... Tell you what, how easy it is to clean all this out. Yeah, we covered a well. You covered quite a lot of things. So I think. Uh, yeah, know. I'm going to um, actually. The quickest way to get for me is from that link right uh, here. All right, so you open up your print table, your screen print table, and um, you basically, um, your white base pricing you can do is an extra charge. So that would be your flash charge. I can't believe you said flash charge. I thought we'd find, I thought 30 years from when I started this business or so, that term would finally go away. <laughs> <laughs> I, I say that kiddingly. Um, I know it uses a flash, but. Um, Anyhow, I'll, I'll tell you why I think that's funny. But first, let me tell you what you really care about. So you can set up as an extra charge, which is setting up a flash rate. And that means for each quantity, you can change that value. So, you know, 25 cents, 15 cents, so forth. Now, in the industry, particularly, and I know in the contract business, uh, flash charge was common. And that was how they, you know, you got a six color imprint. If it's in the dark, add a flash charge. I like to think that I was one of the huge proponents two decades ago that pushed hard away from that because I felt that we were, I thought it was a bogus system because it's not accurate. The truth of the matter is if I set up um, 12 pieces or 24 pieces and I need an underbase, it's an extra screen and 25 cents isn't enough. But then again, if I have a flat rate on my price sheet for a flash charge and I'm printing a thousand or 2000 pieces, 25 cents is probably too much. The reality is it's an additional color any way you look at it. 
it's an additional color. I have to set up a screen. So it's just like adding a second color, um, adding an underbase. Um, most of the industry, and I know a heck of a lot of folks, that is the standard method, which is why Deco introduced that years ago, where you actually use it as an additional color. That's that if you want to change it to a flat rate, you can use as an extra charge, and it does let you change that flat rate depending on the quantity, and that would work as well. Um, and there is a benefit to that. Kind of goes back to, I just thought of something. It kind of does go back to that question. Um, I forget who posted earlier, Victor, but mm -hmm. this, this does raise a good uh, point. If you don't want to charge a setup charge, for, so for instance, if you have um, Deco um, charging a screen charge, which is in under decoration pricing, I believe, right? If I go to um, screen printing, there it um, is. Setup B, and I want to say it's twenty-five dollars per color there, but I don't want to charge it on the underbase. I would go back to that price table, and if I use the extra charge instead of what I like, the additional color. You can treat this the same way, and guess what? They won't have a screen charge for it. So if I know that, but, I, but yet I want to charge it an additional color, right? and I'm always adding, say, 25, 50 cents here, 25 cents for this column, and 10 cents for this column, I could just mimic that for my flat rate uh, base charge. But because I'm not calling it a screen print, it won't charge that extra screen charge. So actually, that's the solution. Um, for that previous question. I, I want to say Sarah, I guess, but I forget. I hope that answers it. Okay. So next question here is from Aaron, and he has three parts uh, to um, his question. Let's start with the first one. So how should I upcharge screen print costs per color for light textile versus dark textile? Wait, mark up uh, the screen print price? Yeah, that's what the question is. I'm assuming that's white base. Is that right? How should I upcharge screen print costs per color for light textile versus dark textile? Well, I would, I would actually, um, it would be the same. And let's use a visual uh, to to show that. So, in other words, um, where was I? I think I'm going back to that screen print table. So when I set up my price table in Deco. These run charges don't care what color shirt is. If I, my labor is going to be, the factor is always going to be that underbase mm -hmm. or should be. So if I'm printing, um, I assume we're talking about the decorating pricing is what it sounds like to me. And as far as garment markup, I would, that should be the same across the board as well. Now what, what, but, what I'm thinking is the garment color itself. So yeah. Um, so, yeah. so if I have a five color imprint on a white shirt, and I chart the price is going to be it's going to be the same for a white shirt, a pink shirt, which would be a light, let's say, mm -hmm. or a dark shirt. The only change would be um, do is I'm assuming is trying to cover for the um, under base and flash time. You know, maybe your press slows down, and if it's slowing down too much, by the way, there's stuff you can do. You should fix that in production because honestly, you should be able to print 750 an hour in a dark. Just you know, you really, if you've got it done right, you should be able to almost barely have your press stop with the flash, but that's a whole other seminar. So, um, so your price table would be the same for every color with the only variable in most cases, that's the way it's, almost everybody does it, including myself, is the only variable would be um, adding for an underbase, whether it's a flat charge you charge or an additional color, um, like we were discussing here earlier. And that, if you feel that your press rates are slower for darks and uh, with that, that's where you would try to factor in that additional time. It's just on that. So customer looks at the, you know, or you have your pricing all set up for all your colors. When they pick a light, or you can tell Deco, by the way, when to use an under, under base, whether it's on lights and darks or just darks. I advise lights and darks because although there are a few colors where you don't use a base, you know, maybe ash or, or, or certain colors, most of them, even the lights, you're going to find in use in underbase. That is not a perfect world. I'll be honest with you on that. There's times I run into it's like, well, they want, they don't want the systems charging them for an additional color, but they're printing navy ink on a red shirt. Mm -hmm. So we'll do we do a manual override and just plug in the pricing for a one color instead of a two color because the system thinks, okay, it's navy ink, 
it's a dark shirt factor in an underbase. It doesn't, it's, it doesn't, it's not smart enough to know that it can exclude dark ink colors. Hope that answers your question. All right. Um, his follow up to that is um, also, what are the standard garment quantity breaks for screen printing? And it gives an example. So minimum quantity of 12 pieces, and then the next price break, 13 pieces, through 24 pieces, and, and so on. Are there any standards? Like, what are those breaks? I don't know if I would call it standards. Um, although, that said, there's... Hey guys, it's Victor here again. The original webinar broadcast disconnected at the two hour mark. The good news is that we were able to get in over an hour worth of Q&A time. This was an amazing turnout with amazing engagement. Thank you guys for that. We'll be doing more webinars in the near future, so make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. Those are excellent places to keep up to date with our upcoming events. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you guys on the next one.